Lynn, the world is going mad. Can you can you make me feel better? I don't know what's going Lynn, what's going on? Well, it depends on you mean in Bitcoin land or in macro land or both. <laughs> Everything. Everything seems to be going mad. Bitcoin's mad. Biden's mad. Everything's mad. Everything's gone crazy. Are you calm? Are you, are you, are you think everything's okay? Well, I mean, these things go in cycles. Uh, and so, you know, one of my approaches is basically to have some degree of diversification. And that kind of minimizes some of these big volatility moves. And so usually there's something in the portfolio that's not doing well. And now there's something else that is doing well. Um, but basically, you know, what we saw with Bitcoin, I think, you know, I think one of the things that's not in the discussion enough is the impact of grayscale. Okay. Uh, and so, so Elon, for example, is getting a lot of the attention as well as some of these, uh, you know, government uh, kind of crackdowns. Uh, but, you know, the way I see it is that really uh, Grayscale is kind of what set the stage for this. And so if you look back, for example, uh, from, say, the second half of, of 2020 into, the you know, January of 2021, uh, they bought literally hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. They were the, they were the biggest buyer. There were multiple micro strategies worth of purchases. And a lot of that, you know, some of that was actually people that just wanted to be long Bitcoin. Uh, but another big chunk of that was people doing the arbitrage trade, where they would mm-hmm. they'd buy buy into, into Grayscale at, at net asset value. So they issue new shares. Uh, basically, that converts liquid Bitcoin into illiquid Bitcoin. It gets locked into, into their cold storage. Uh, and then they hold it for six months during the lockup period while they short Bitcoin on the side. So they have a Bitcoin neutral position. And then after six months, they can sell those uh, GBT shares on the market, including whatever premium to nav they're, they're, they, they trade at. And that's often, it gets as low as like 5% sometimes, but it often got as high as you know 40 or 50%. And so they could do that twice a year. And every time they did that trade, when they were done with the position, uh, those Bitcoin are permanently in grayscale. Uh, they're not redeemable or anything like that. So they stay in there. And every time they do the trade, those neutral arbitragers keep basically putting more and more Bitcoin into that big honeypot of Bitcoin. Uh, and when the when the discount turned negative, that's something we've talked about, uh, I mm-hmm. think, in a previous show. Uh, that basically, you know, Grayscale is not harmed by that in the sense that there's no solvency issues or anything like that. It's normal for for those funds to trade at a at a discount, you know, outside of the Bitcoin world. Closed end funds often do. Uh, but basically, what it did it it removed that arbitrage trade. Uh, and so they're no longer issuing new shares. That's basically the downside to Grayscale is that there's no way to grow really when you're when you're trading at a discount to NAV. And so that whole kind of neutral arbitrage source of Bitcoin demand dried up. And so we we saw the kind of as Bitcoin stop, as a Grayscale stopped buying, we saw this kind of multi-month consolidation where it was kind of making you know Bitcoin is making new highs there, but not not very strongly. It was kind of you know from February to to May, it was kind of in that sort of range bound pattern. Uh, and then eventually it was just, you know, you have some price weakness. And so then when, when you get the Elon news and you get the China FUD and you get the the U.S. kind of uh, tax crackdown. And, you know, today we had uh, Japan comments. Uh, and so basically all these things kind of hit it while it was somewhat weak. And so, you know, kind of what we have to look forward now is just, it was like basically we say, OK, so we got that couple quarters of that that neutral demand is basically removed from the market now. And so the big question is, what is the next source of demand? Are we going right. to see more institutions come in? Are we going to see you know hodlers kind of you know keep holding? And I think you know one of the main things I'm looking at for the next cycle is this whole topic of Bitcoin rewards. Uh, you know, you, things like with the Fold app, things with mm-hmm. uh, what Night what Nidig is doing to part with banks. A lot of that's going to launch you know uh, based on their public comments. You know, may, you know in the next year or so. Uh, and we have so, the BlockFi card coming out. Exactly. And so when you have all those kind of things together. That's kind of another source of of demand that I think kind of come in and pull Bitcoin off the market. But in the meantime, we're in this kind of intermediate period uh, where you know we've lost one source of of demand and the market's kind of adjusting to that. So uh, that's kind of normal when when things get excessive. Right. So it was a frothy market because of the arbitrage with GBTC. And okay, so so the the de- supply and demand schedule has kind of changed. Yeah, it got a little bit more balanced now. Essentially, yeah. and then when you so, have some kind of bad news, and I think the market's now repricing some of the probabilities of other corporations putting in, uh, say, Bitcoin into their balance sheet because now they have to weigh if it's an ESG concern or not. Mm-hmm. And you know, my view is that it's it's not an ESG concern, but that the narrative that it is an ESG concern is a risk to kind of keep monitoring. Typical Bitcoin crazy world. Did were you uh, trading or looking at Bitcoin back in 2017, or is this your first kind of like? 
Uh, so I, yeah, I wrote, I first wrote about Bitcoin in late 2017. Uh, and, and I, I always often use that in my origin story when I talk about Bitcoin, essentially that I, I, I covered it in November 2017 and I passed on it for a couple of reasons. Uh, but then over the course of 2018, 2019, uh, you know, Bitcoin largely addressed those concerns. One is, you know, one concern was the euphoric price action. So we had a multi-year consolidation that, that took that away. And then two, uh, you know, basically I was worried about the Bitcoin fork that happened. Mm-hmm. I was worried about just alt season and dilution in general, like whether Bitcoin's network effect is strong enough to kind of hold it, hold the tide against a thousand altcoins. And I was just kind of watching that play out. And so when I saw kind of the, the, the build out, the strengthening of the network effect over the next couple of years, uh, I ended up buying in early 2020 at the same price that I passed on in, in late 2017. And so basically nice. in my view, it got, it got de-risked. So I have been covering it more or less you know, since then. What was the Japanese comment this morning? Sorry, it's uh, seven, o'clock, oh, 7 o'clock in LA, so I haven't seen it yet. Uh, it's just basically that the central bank governor came out, and uh, I, I don't know exactly what he said. I only looked at it briefly. Uh, okay. Basically that, you know, the, the same thing that UK and, and, and Fed officials have said, that basically it's, it's kind of a speculation. And basically it was a, a dismissive uh, remark against Bitcoin. I, I've never experienced what feels like such a coordinated set of attacks. The, the timing of everything happened all at, in the last two weeks. Is, is, I, f- I feel kind of incredible. Um, but then at the same time with, with Bitcoin, you kind of get used to things being a bit strange and trying to, to ride it out. I mean, I'm hodling through. I, I, I still think the long-term picture is awesome. Um, I agree. I do want to come back to Bitcoin, uh, but... I actually just want to like shift gears a bit and talk a little bit about ESG and uh, what happened with uh, the the stuff that came out from Elon. So the ESG, how, how much of a consideration are you having to take in your now macro picture and your updates with regards to ESG and how strong is this movement? Well, it's definitely a strong movement. I, I think my subscribers... Um... You know, some people are in, are interested in ESG, whereas other ones are are just interested in, in whatever has the best risk adjusted returns on on different sort of, of uh, equities. And one of the things I do think it factors in a number of ways. And I, I you know, for example, aside from Bitcoin, I think one of the things we're going to run into uh, is some energy price issues later this decade, uh, because you know we're kind of the world's kind of now assuming that we're going to move off of oil, natural gas, and coal pretty quickly, and that therefore investing in them is bad. And that you know companies should be punished for for you know kind of doing uh, uh, exploration or or you know capex in that area, and the issue is that the United you know the world's never moved from from a, a like a to a less dense primary energy source. Uh, so basically, you know we went from wood to coal to oil to nuclear hydro uh, while still using all those things, and we kind of started adding solar and wind on top of that as a very small piece. But those are less dense energy sources, and a lot of those are made with you know, you, you honestly, you ironically make them with fossil fuels. Uh, and so it's kind of a challenge there to, to move to a, a world where you're not even relying on these at all. Another thing I like to point out is that whenever we find a new energy source, we actually never diminish the previous energy source. So, for example, humanity used to rely on biomass and we found coal. We, ever, we never actually stopped. We never reduced our biomass consumption. We just added coal to it. And then when we found oil and gas, we added that to our coal. But we, you know, coal pretty much flatlined. It never really went went down in any meaningful way, at least not yet. And then now that we've we've you know got oil and gas, we added nuclear and all these others. But we still have you know rising gas and oil demand overall. And so basically, we keep adding energy sources without ever subtracting energy sources. Is that also due to technological advancements? Um, where you say we added oil and, and gas, but was was that kind of uh, growth? in line with the growth of uh, transport, air travel, car growth. Uh, does it relate to that at all? Yeah, each new energy source was essentially kind of a, you know, at least up to a point, was a technological revolution. They enabled new types of things. You couldn't have airplanes with coal, mm. for example. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you, ne- you needed these, these uh, you know, oil and gas derivatives to do that. Uh, and so, you know, basically, as we've kind of come this far, we, we've added these better energy sources, denser energy sources. And so, you know, I think going forward, the big challenge is that the world's kind of assuming now we're going to go to, to these less dense energy sources and it's going to be smooth. Uh, but I think, you know, basically this lack of CapEx is probably going to cause some shortages. 
you know, looking a few years out. Uh, and so I think that the ESG kind of overall viewpoint, uh, it's one of those things where I'm certainly in favor of, of greener world where possible, like, you know, better air quality, better water quality, things like that. But I'm wary of greenwashing, things that, that you know, that basically consist of virtue signaling about being green or kind of, you know, checking boxes or trying to do things to get the the non-green stuff off your balance sheet and onto someone else's balance sheet. So it's like a hot potato. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the kind of stuff I, I worry about, uh, where, you know, basically that, that we we're more interested in looking like we're solving the problem rather than actually solving the problem. And, and are you seeing that though? Well, I think we are seeing that. I mean, for, you know, for example, and some of it is, some of it has good impacts and some has bad impacts. And so for example, one issue is that, you know, we've had so much, uh, aggressive, uh, say oil and gas drilling in the United States over the past decade. And a lot mm-hmm. of that was unprofitable. Uh, so basically, you had the combination of really cheap money, so central bank, low interest rates, quantitative easing, things like that, combined with you know improvements in technology, made these shale uh, industries somewhat viable. Even though you know over the course of the decade, the full investing cycle it never really was free cash flow positive. So basically, uh, people just kept piling in. But now with the whole ESG concern, uh, you know a lot of those pensions have pulled back their investments, which helps the energy market kind of right size itself. Uh, but I think it's it's one of those things the pendulum can go too far where we had a period of overinvestment. And I think, you know, as we go out a couple more years, we're probably, you know, we're, we're increasing the odds of seeing a period of underinvestment. So will that be good for the price of oil if you're an oil investor? Uh, yes. Now, if that plays out, if basically, if, uh, you know, right now we have, a, a, we still have a period of oversupply in the sense that OPEC has a significant amount of spare capacity, which is normally what you see in, in kind of weaker economic periods. Uh, but as you look out a couple of years, Assuming there's there's no kind of major second lockdown or some, some sort of you know curveball, but basically uh, on a normal trajectory, oil market looks tight a couple years out, uh, and so that would be good for the price of oil and, and for probably energy stocks uh, that are participating in it. Uh, but basically, it's just it's one of the concerns overall that basically we we might be shifting from a period of overinvestment to underinvestment, and the, the basically that there's you know a lot of interest in in companies to look green. More so than be green. Do we do we know the the uh, the mix for the usage of oil? What what is air travel? What is uh, motor vehicles, etc. Uh, that is known. I don't have it on the top of my head. You know, so oil itself is not uh, used very much for the electrical grid. That's mostly natural gas and other things. Oil is heavily used for transportation. Mm. Uh, so a big chunk of it's diesel, right? So trucks, uh, you know, uh, uh, ships and uh, construction equipment and all that. Uh, then you have a large portion, obviously, for for automobiles. Uh, uh, derivatives of it are used for air travel. It's a it's a sizable chunk, uh, and then another huge chunk of it is used for petrochemicals. So, like literally the the sh- the casings of the computers we're using, and the, the mm-hmm. mice, and like uh, the things you know, probably part of our clothes, probably part of your hat. Like a lot of that is just like you know made from from oil derivatives, um, and and so that's kind of a, a big chunk of things as well. So it's it's kind of that that big mix. Um, with the oil derivatives, as you talk about my hat <laughs> and probably my iPod case, which I'm using, and my sorry, my earpods. Um, outside of uh, waste pollution, does the processing of do you know if the processing of these uh, products uh, adds much in terms of pollution? I haven't looked into the the details of the refining process in in too yeah. much detail, but. That's not the biggest source of it. I mean, the biggest source of it, it, it kind of goes down the list. And so overall, the, the dirtiest one would be coal in terms of burning mm-hmm. it for, for energy because not only, you know, the CO2 issue, but then aside from the CO2 issue, it's the particulates, right? So the CO2 issue is more of a, a longer range concern that people have, whereas the particulates are here and now concern. That's basically the air is literally dirtier because you're burning coal. Uh, and the people like there's there's studies that show, for example, over a million people worldwide die from direct causes of air pollution. Uh, and and you know we know from living in certain, say, if you go to certain cities like in India or China, uh, where they're kind of unusually, uh, you know, coal driven, uh, kind of on the higher end of that curve, they're very generally dirty cities, and it, that contributes to health issues. And the same thing for concentrated, you know, a lot of cars in one area, uh, that contributes to air smog. Uh, whereas when you go up to, when you go up to say natural gas, it's a little bit cleaner when you go up to, to nuclear and, 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 you know, hydro has some of its own economic, you know, uh, ecological issues, but generally it's, it's considered cleaner. 
nuclear is uh, you know, statistically cleaner. Uh, the refining process itself is certainly an energy intensive thing. Uh, and there are, for example, there are, there are pipeline leaks during the transportation process or the refining process. Uh, but overall, I don't, I don't view that as kind of the problematic area. Well, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, um, it it feels it feels to me that when you talk about uh, virtual si- virtual signaling, it feels to me with also everything else you're saying that actually moving away, like changing the energy mix, is a hugely difficult, complex, multi-year, probably multi-decade process that might not actually it might change the mix, but the total output might not change. Exactly. Yeah. I just wanted. Yeah. Basically, over time. For example, like I mentioned, every time we find a new energy source, we add to the previous one. And so the previous one becomes a smaller percentage of our total energy mix, but doesn't actually go down in, in a meaningful way. Um, and, and so hopefully we can change that with coal eventually. I'd like to see coal kind of you know diminish over time um, with, with some of these better energy sources that we have. Uh, but basically, it is, it is very hard to change your, your primary energy mix you know, by, by eliminating previous energy sources um, and, and especially, you know, the, the new thing overall would be moving to a less dense primary energy source rather than using those, you know, kind of optimal locations where possible to actually move kind of primarily to lower dense energy sources is, is some, that's a, you know, big technological challenge. Is there much uh, investment going in this area? Is there much interest in some of the companies who are investing in, in these less dense energy sources? Well, there's been a moderate, I mean, basically I, I would say that the, you know, the, EV stocks, for example, uh, mm. they're working on battery technology. I mean, they've, they've obviously had a ton of excitement by, by investors over the past couple of years. Um, you know, solar, solar companies have had these kind of waves of investment. Uh, they've historically not been super profitable companies. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's work being done in, in hydroelectric, I mean, uh, not hydroelectric, um, hydrogen cell. Um, and so one, one big thing to be aware of is that a lot of this transfers, you know, instead of using fossil fuels, you're, you're really, you know, it's not like you're getting energy from nothing. You're basically, you're transferring it. So you're getting energy from metals, right? So you, you, you're basically, you're relying on more nickel, copper, uh, steel, which, which, you know, iron and, and coal, um, you're basically kind of shifting that if that's successful, if you, if you say have solar and wind and some of these other, you know, sources and, and batteries as more of a, you know, the energy mechanism that we're using. It's more metals intensive, uh, you know, type of economy. Yeah. The other thing that's been kind of interesting is also looking at the uh, the other impacts of moving to uh, less dense energy sources or more renewables. Uh, I yeah, I've been reading about cobalt mining, lithium mining. I've also been looking into the waste uh, produced from wind farms in construction. Um, it it feels like. It feels like whatever whatever we try and do here, whatever f- form of energy source we move to, there is still going to be some form of uh, ecolog- uh, ecological impact. Or so I, I don't know. I I feel very almost a bit confused by it all because um, we hear these messages, we we hear things from different people explaining um, the problems with the environment, the problems with. Uh, um, uh, pollution, yeah, everything seems to be producing something. That's the biggest challenge. And and yeah. again, you know, a lot of the interest is is blaming others and getting things off the balance sheet. So one one kind of trend I've seen is, you know, we keep emphasizing how much energy uses China's using, for example, right? So yeah. and they're and they're pretty coal driven. But there's two things about that. One is they're using far less per capita than than we do uh, in the Western world. So who's the worst offender? On a per capita basis, it's probably some small country. It's probably like one of the Gulf states, or, or you know, like Singapore. It's probably one of those like city small ones when you get down to that. Right. But basically, but the United States is one of the biggest users. Uh, basically, the ones the the countries that have a lot of land mass uh, relative to the population that generally have you know single family homes and stuff. So when you have like Canada, United States, and Australia and things like that, they tend to be pretty heavy per capita energy users. Europe generally is uh, less. Uh, but it varies across the the continent. Uh, and then when you get obviously into emerging markets or frontier markets, they use a lot less per capita. And so something like China uses, so it's like, you know, uh, China uses like one sixth of the oil per capita as the United States, and then India uses like less than half uh, per capita that China uses. Um, wow. And so that's that's kind of the environment we're in. Another thing is that, for example, 
the Western world has partially shifted our supply chains over to China. So some of our most energy intensive things of making stuff, we hand it all over to China and then they, and then we blame them for their energy consumption. Whereas their funny thing is even the, even the fact that they're using less oil, some of that oil they're still using for us, essentially. Uh, we, you know, we, we've outsourced some of our most energy intensive things to them. So it's like, okay, we'll write the software and we'll, we'll design the healthcare molecules and we'll, we'll run the financial system, which is less kind of directly energy intensive. And we kind of pushed over some of the manufacturing to those emerging markets. And then we're like, oh, look, look how much coal they use. I did an interview with Nick Carter and Alex Gladstein this week regarding the petrodollar. And Alex was explaining uh, the petrodollar is likely the cause of a lot of the manufacturing moving out from the US into uh, China. Have, have you ever looked into that? Yeah, I wrote a, um, uh, a big article back in December. Of course you have. Uh, and, and Alex's piece was great. He, he mentioned my piece as well. And so this is, uh, you know, it's been, it's been Bitcoiners in general have been more focusing on this over the past several months. Uh, you basically compare, you know, because people often say you're comparing Bitcoin to the current system. So there's more interest in the, in the recent months about kind of looking into the system. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, the reason I analyze the petrodollar system so much is because it, the dollar really is kind of at the crux of global macro. Uh, so even in my investing decisions outside of Bitcoin, you're really understanding the dollar's details are, are a key part of getting macro right, whether it's you're going to get inflation or deflation, commodity boom, commodity bust, emerging market boom, emerging market bust, whether or not U.S. growth is going to be fast or slow. A lot of it's based on the dollar. And so basically because we structured things uh, ever since the 70s around this petrodollar system, uh, it's basically exported a lot of supply chains, especially from the United States. Uh, to these other emerging markets uh, led by led by China, but also others. Yeah, one of the most interesting things Alex talked about, that this is just completely off topic, but I just found it fascinating, that um, he talked about the second Gulf War. And he talked about, uh, at that time, the uh, Iraq, Iraq government was selling their oil with the petro, uh, to the, for the petro-euro. I think it was the petro-euro. And he said one of the interesting things is that what seems to be out of the debate for a war that we know nothing about for why it happened seems to be uh, for absolutely no reasons at all that actually might have been to defend the petrodollar, which I found fascinating. That's one of the theories. And, and, and so, for example, uh, you know, that, that got some, some publicity when Ron Paul spoke in Congress about it, which is you know, kind of the highest stage that that idea has had, where he was basically, you know, there's, there's a big speech. I actually linked to it in one of my pieces. Um, and so, yeah, basically, you know, the, the, there's not a good track record of basically these countries trying to sell oil outs, uh, outside of the dollar-based system. And so far, actually, the most successful country that's doing it now is Russia. And it's kind of like one of the, so in the past few years, they switched to, you know, selling oil uh, increasingly in euros uh, to Europe and, and, and as far as we can tell, into China. Uh, and, but they're obviously big enough that the United States can't do anything militarily about it. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're a major nuclear power. They're, and so uh, instead we have, you know, we've had these big sanction debates about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we've had these, these, you know, other issues. And it's kind of a chicken and the egg scenario. And so countries that are generally, for whatever reason, on the margins, for, for political reasons, could be extremism, whatever the case may be, when they're kind of sanctioned, they increasingly turn to selling oil outside of the dollar-based system but also, if, if a country kind of sells oil outside of the dollar-based system, they tend to be these kind of relentless source of, of sanctions. Uh, and so it's just kind of, we basically have structured things in such a way that we have kind of an in or out kind of system. And if you're not in, then you're, you're, you're pushed on the margins and you generally struggle as a country. Do you think the, the petrodollar is gradually being replaced? Do you think it will collapse? Do you think countries will continue to look at other currencies to trade oil in there are there are signs that it's changing and i i went over these in my article but essentially there's a couple key things to look at one is that when the petrodollar system began in the 70s the united states was something like 35 percent of world gdp and we were the biggest commodity importer uh and so you could you could argue that it makes more sense to price commodities in dollars uh but now over time as that's kind of deteriorated uh the united states is now depending on how you measure it somewhere in the ballpark of 20 percent of global gdp um, and so even though we've grown, just the rest of the world's grown faster because you had the rise of China and India and some of these other countries. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're a smaller share of global GDP. We're still outsized, of course, compared to our population. We're like something like 5% of population, 20% of global GDP. Uh, we're this, but now we're the second biggest commodity importer. And so it's it's kind of funny situation where the biggest commodity importer, China, has to go through our currency in order to, to get commodities. And so they're, they're interested in increasingly, uh, you know, uh, using their currency to, to buy commodities where possible. Uh, and then you have Russia, which is also, no, you know, no particular friend to the United States. And they've, they've uh, you know, kind of aggressively de-dollarized de their reserves. They went increasingly into gold and euro-based assets instead. And then they announced, you know, a couple years back that they were interested in selling oil and euros. And if you look at their, uh, you know, their trade over time, uh, with Europe and with China uh, is de-dollarizing gradually and shifting more towards uh, euro for both of them. Uh, and then also with, with China, they're also using a little bit of local currencies as well. Uh, you know, neither dollar nor euro, but primarily they're they're replacing a big chunk of the dollar portion with euros. And so over time, you know, we're looking to see probably more uh, diverse reserves uh, among countries, and that there that there looks like there could eventually be say three currencies that can be used to buy uh, oil rather than just one. That, that feels a lot more healthy. That, that is a more, it's a more decentralized system. Um, and it's, it's uh, even ironically for the United States. And so one of the biggest misconceptions is that the system benefits the United States. And it's one of those things where in the first few decades, it, it might have, um, mm -hmm. you know, basically Cold War era type thing, strategic positioning, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but especially since the 90s, it's really kind of accelerated to the downside, even for the United States. And so it's one of those things where there's probably the top 10% of the people in the United States benefit from it, right? Including me and direct, I mean, I, you know, I, I probably benefit from it, but anyone who in the United States works in blue collar work or, you know, wants to make things essentially, they, they've taken the brunt of this in the United States. And so the system's one of those, it's, it's, you know, it's working for a few um, export heavy countries that are really kind of milking the system. Uh, and it's, and it's working for, U.S. elites and it's working for basically these these kind of select uh, groups around the world, but it's really not working well for most emerging markets, and it's not working well for uh, you know most of the United States, probably the, at least the bottom two thirds. Is there anything you don't know? <laughs> I feel like I throw any question at you any week, and and you know everything. Well, I think you I think you you smartly ask things in in fields that I know. If you ask well, me about like I don't, I didn't know your uh, I didn't know your refining question about what. Where, where, you know, how energy intensive or how polluting is refining. You'll know next week. How many hours a day do you work? <laughs> Too many. Do you? you do, do you actually take enough time off? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm still hugely disappointed you're not going to be at Bitcoin 2021. I actually am now. <sighs> you are coming. Yeah, changed. Yeah. Yes. Are you speaking? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I have, I'm scheduled to do an event with Elizabeth Stark. We're going to talk about about basically uh, Bitcoin for billions rather than billionaires. billionaires. Like how, yeah. Yeah. I had a similar conversation with her uh, on Twitter spaces when I was in El Salvador because I was down there looking at the project. Uh, obviously, I think Elizabeth is amazing. Well, that's incredible. Uh, do you know what day you get in? Mine is, mine's on Saturday. My, my, it's like Saturday around noontime or so is when I'm talking. So you're just coming in for that? Oh, I'll be in, I'll be in uh, I think the, the second. I think it was offhand. I'm going to send you an invite to my party if you can make it. <laughs> we've got, yeah, a, we've got a party. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out my schedule there. It's kind of hectic. <laughs> There's so my much first, going on. Yeah. And it's also my first time traveling in this whole kind of era. I haven't gone through the hassle of, uh, you know, wanting to wear masks on an airplane and things like uh, that. It's not too bad. There is a trick on the airplane because they have these moronic rules whereby you have to wear a mask, but if they've served you a drink, you don't. So you can just take slow sips constantly from your drink and leave yeah, your I'll mask kind of on your chin. That's what I've been doing. The traveling <laughs> isn't too bad. It it, it 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 wasn't as bad as I expected. The worst bit for me was trying to just get from El Salvador to Guatemala. What was really interesting is those countries uh, seem to be a lot more hot on their tracking of people coming in and providing of information. It really surprised me. So when I left the UK, I they asked to see my uh, COVID certificate. Um, I could have easily just made that on my computer. Uh, and that was pretty much it. Whereas when I went between uh, El Salvador and Guatemala, they wanted that. They wanted proof of the receipt to check that I hadn't just made that on my computer. 
They also wanted to do a, um, they had to do like a temperature test and made sure I, like they made me clean my hands and like they just, there was a lot more done on it. And I was just really surprised that the the US and the UK uh, are kind of COVID um, operations just seem to be a little bit more basic. It's just really surprising. Well, I'm glad you're coming. That's amazing. You're going to love it. It's going to be crazy. 10,000 Bitcoin is going wild all week. Um, and I look forward to seeing your speech. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is I, I, I want you to just shine a little bit of light that you have on Tesla because obviously Elon had his... Um, uh, 180 moment f- very soon after telling the world that they would be accepting Bitcoin for Teslas and then they would be holding that on the balance sheet. He did a 180 and said they won't be and their concerns about coal, which you know sent everyone into a tailspin. But uh, a lot of there's a lot of suspicion with this, a lot of references towards the tax credits, um, how much their business relies on these carbon tax credits. I'm certain you will have looked into this, so I'd love to. N- can you shine a light on it, um, how their business operates, how important these tax credits are, how much you know? And then also, uh, I want to ask you, what is your take on what Mr. Musk is up to? Because I imagine you have a good one. So, yeah, currently Tesla is pretty reliant on these credits. Uh, and basically, you know, it, re- it was reported in the past year uh, that they they achieved profitability for the first time. And one of the criteria to be put into the S&P 500 is you have to be profitable for like four consecutive quarters. Uh, and uh, once you're in the S&P 500, you get a lot of automatic passive capital just goes in your company. Um, and so uh, basically, if you look at their profit margin, uh, you know, without the credits, they're still not profitable. It's really those 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 credits kind of made the difference and made them profitable. How do the credits it, work, though? It's not a market that I follow super closely. Basically, okay. it's, you know, there's actually, and there's different verges, there's different jurisdictions of credits. Um and but basically, uh, you know, they they because they're considered green, they they get these credits that that basically help them out. They're basically essentially government subsidies to try to, you know, shift more more emphasis towards electric vehicles, renewable energy, um, and so they benefit from these credits, uh, and and that made the difference in terms of being marginally profitable. They're still you know barely profitable, but it's it's marginally profitable enough to get into the S and P five hundred, for example, um, and. Uh, so if you look at Tesla's history, they, you know, they, they've had trouble making money from selling cars and other technology, but they've, they've made money from the credits and they've also made money primarily from selling their shares. Uh, and so because there's always tons of hype around Tesla, and then especially in the past couple of years, uh, you know, they basically have, you know, when they, when they, when their stock price goes up a ton, Elon then does like an, an equity offering where they, they sell new, they create new shares, sell them to the public, uh, and they get all those cash. Uh, and so, you know, before they had a pretty weak balance sheet, they had a decent amount of debt. They weren't making money, uh, at least not profit. Um, and they, you know, they're actually, they were junk rated. They were literally junk debt. Uh, whereas if you look at companies like Apple and Google and, and all those, you know, they're, they're like pristine balance sheets. Uh, whereas Tesla was literally junk debt. And I actually think they're still technically rated junk debt. Um, but basically what they did is because they were so popular with, with investors, and their stock got so expensive on a, on a price sales multiple, on a price to earnings ratio, pretty much any way to measure it, their stock was extremely expensive. They were they got to the point where they were they were worth as much as all other like car companies in the yeah. world combined. Yeah, even though they have a you know they're selling like a fraction of the cars, have a fraction of the R and D budget. At this point, they're not even the biggest like electrical seller in Europe, uh, electric vehicle seller. Um, Is that true? I did not know that. Vol- Volkswagen's been ramping up across their brands. Um, Wow, they're just uh, doing a better job of uh, marketing and PR then. Yeah, they're, uh, well, it's one of those things where they certainly, you know, they, they've they been very strong in the in the upper end electric vehicle market. But yeah, we are starting to see increased competition from from Porsche uh, and some of these others uh, that are kind of entrance into the space. Um, and and now, for example, we have the, you know, Fords coming out with their, with their Lightning pickup truck. Uh, but basically, you know, Tesla's made a ton of money from two things, selling equity, which is essentially selling a story. Uh, and then two, so basically, in, in some ways, Elon's been a huge value creator for Tesla because the story of like basically like this like Tony Stark kind of guy, like you know at least the the vision of that has has it basically helped help them. It literally it literally helps them get a stronger balance sheet because they sold so much equity. And then two, the the credits made a big difference. And so yeah, I think I think the speculation is fair that Elon got a tap on the shoulder by by someone. 
uh, to to basically you know reverse course on this. Uh, that basically that you know Bitcoin might not be ESG enough or something uh, from whatever authorities have influence over that. But it, it's again it's speculation. Uh, it could be that other people in the company, you know, board members were concerned mm-hmm. about it. Uh, it's hard to know if that came from internal or external. Uh, but it was a, a pretty sudden flip. And overall, I think, you know, Elon's going through this process where he's learning in public. Uh, he seems to be starting with the mindset of like, I'm new to Bitcoin. I want to, you know, fix it rather than I'm new to new to Bitcoin. I want to learn about it. That was the exact, uh, I was interviewing uh, Eric Weinstein yesterday. And it, this this was on my agenda is learning in public. It's a conversation I've had with a few people because it's a tricky thing. Um, especially, you know, I've been through the the. Uh, uh, washer with it, learning in public, getting things wrong and having people shout at me and shouting back and then going away and relearning. But when you're doing that with 56 million followers, there can be quite the impact. It's also a difference between knowing that you're learning in public versus thinking that you know more. Whereas like other people know you're learning in public, but you don't realize you're learning in public. Yeah. Right? So there's a difference. So if someone is is purposely learning in public, building a brand on learning in public, uh, because that that's all got all sorts of benefits. It makes you relatable. Uh, it basically, you know, helps helps you kind of learn things along with the readers, uh, so that you're kind of going through the process together. Where someone kind of comes in as though they're an expert, but other experts can see that they're actually learning in public uh, while they have a massive base. Uh, that has, that obviously causes issues. And uh, some of these have real world consequences, like people that went all in on Dogecoin, for example, um, especially the ones that came in later right so maybe some of the early no. people yeah but some of the people that came in later are now invested in dogecoin with, with maybe without understanding some of the technical differences that make it you know different than bitcoin Let's just call it what it is it's an absolute shit coin <laughs> it's, it's not tell it anything other than what dogecoin is okay sorry anyway so hmm it makes it quite complicated a quite complicated picture for bitcoin and um I've really been split on this mining council. My immediate reaction as somebody who always reacts very quickly without thinking things through sometimes was, this is terrible, this is you know, this is a, an authority on Bitcoin. But at the same time, I can understand why people want to defend the narrative to be able to have the data and have the argument because what happens is the mainstream media perpetuates these narratives. Um, I... I, th- I, I Imagine you could go to any mainstream publication, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Financial Times, The Times, The Telegraph, any of them, and if you did a search for Bitcoin, you'll find a negative energy uh, article. So it would be great for each time one of these comes up to have the data, to actually have the uh, data on energy mix for Bitcoin mining, but also to have the comparable data to other industries to give a chance to fight back. So I think there's something interesting in there. I'm not so sure on the idea of a council, but I think having the data would be useful. I agree. I mean, it's one of those things where there's pros and cons. Because Bitcoin is is decentralized, open source, you know, there's nothing preventing miners from colluding, uh, you know, for, for better or worse. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's certainly, you can have a cultural uh, of, of kind of frowning on, on secret deals, right? So Bitcoin has this kind of, you know, I think a good culture of, not appreciating these secret backend deals, they they prefer the development to be out in public, um, and so I I, th- I certainly think it's good that there's pushback against it. Um, mm. Another thing to keep in mind is that you know right now the United States is nowhere near uh, hash rate, uh, you know, like a big size of the hash rate, right? So that yeah. might change in the future with some of the the, the you know the hash rate coming out of China, uh, but overall we're currently talking about a pretty small percentage of the hash rate. Uh, but yeah, overall, I, I do think it's good that there are entities that are that want to have basically a way to push back on some of the narrative, uh, even potentially lobbying arms that are out there now, right? Because if there's lobbying arms against you, it helps, unfortunately, to have lobbying arms, you know, back to basically convince state legislators why they might want to have, you know, they might want to be an attractive Bitcoin mining jurisdiction, for example, where you can you can basically, you know, get in front of these politicians and explain why it's useful to them. Uh, and so it is. It is one of those touchy subjects where there's there's pros and cons, and I, I, it's not an area that I've you know, focused too heavily on because uh, with some of these other things on my plate, kind of the mining council has not been uh, top of my list. And there's certainly people more qualified than me to to weigh their opinion on you know, that whole thing. Uh, were, were you or are you short Tesla? Not currently. No. 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, there, there are moments where if, if you know, that if it, if, if it shows certain technical patterns, uh, sometimes I use it as a hedge because uh, it, it, you know, it's basically it, it's a certain type of stock that tends to go down in an environment. So it's a un, you know mostly unprofitable growth stock or you know marginally profitable growth stock, um, and so and I that I consider overvalued, uh, but I'm not currently short it. Are they at risk? Not in the near term. I mean, be, be, they were there was a couple years ago where they were it was looking shakier for them, uh, but but ironically because their stock price got so high and then they issued equity, they really shored up their balance sheet. And so I wouldn't say they're in, they're in risk in the near term. I think the longer term risk for them is that we built, you know, at least for the stock price, the stock price is more at risk than the company in the sense that, you know, the company could continue to do pretty well, make cars, but the stock price could languish for years. Um, mm. We saw that, for example, with, say, I, I like to use the example of Cisco in the 2000s. So Cisco makes those networking equipment. Basically, they're a big backbone of the internet. And so during the '90s, their their stock went absolutely parabolic, just just crazy price. The valuation was silly, and you know from there the revenue kept growing. Uh, and they, you know, the next 20 years, they they were a bigger company now than they were then by a lot. And yet their stock price never fully got back to where it was at the dot com bubble. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's you, you could have a situation like that with Tesla where it achieves some high watermark somewhere. It takes years and years and years for the price to ever get back to that. If it ever gets back, even if the company continues to sell cars uh, and uh, and does reasonably well, and so one of those things, you know, they have to sell like ten times as many cars as now in order to justify the valuation that they have in the longer run. And so the market's kind of pre-priced a lot of that. Yeah, it seems like a couple of their issues is there's increasing competition from the other large manufacturers, but also. Uh, they struggle to to manufacture these cars at a profitable level. That's the down. I mean, yeah, basically, it's it's priced as though it's a software company, but it's a it's a hardware company, and so mm. hardware has has you know lower margins and is is so there's, there's like that um during the dot com bubble there was Sun Microsystems and they're they're one of those other bubble stocks and the guy you know the CEO after the kind of the bubble started to unwind, he had this funny shareholder letter, like he wrote to the, and he's just like, what, what were you guys thinking? He's like, literally you've priced it at 10 times sales, which, you know, like literally that if you assume I make no profit, if you assume that we have no employees, if you assume this, it still takes you 10 years uh, to get back your money. And of course we do have all those things. And so you're, you're, you're at like a hundred times earnings. And so it's like, what were you thinking? And so <laughs> Tesla got to basically the sun microsystem level of extreme valuation, where you have to have you have to, it's not out of the realm of possibility that could they could grow into its valuation. Basically, if you, if say say all of Arc's assumptions, for example, are correct, and you know they they absolutely dominate electrical vehicles, and then their their battery technology is so much better than anyone else's that they license it to all the other manufacturers, and mm-hmm. then they have a big you know then they're say somehow ahead of of uh, driving as well, auto driving. And so they operate this big fleet of, you know, uh, automatic taxis. Basically, if all of say Arc's bullish assumptions come true, there are there, there is like a, a possible universe where the their valuation makes sense. And kind of we look back and say, wow, they they were right. Uh, but I think the I think the probability weighs against that um, uh, overall. And so mm. you know, I think that I, I consider Tesla a pretty risky long investment. Well, I hope Elon stops uh, spouting shit about Bitcoin because it isn't particularly useful. I was actually with uh, somebody yesterday who said that um, he's very bullish on Ethereum because of the ESG narrative and uh, Ethereum moving to proof of stake. Now, I refuse to invest uh, in Ethereum on principles, but we've covered this before, but just very quickly, you have looked at uh, you have looked at proof of stake. Um, and Ethereum. I think, uh, was it Preston? He wanted to get you debating Vitalik on this as well, didn't he? Yeah, he was trying to make that happen. I, <laughs> I, it's one of those things that's funny because I, I did my article and then I, I had a couple of debates on it uh, with people. But did I'm you not get much like... hate? Oh, yeah, with the initial thread, yeah, definitely. <sighs> but I mean, there, well. but it, it varies. So there's some people that were like, so some people loved it. Bitcoiners generally liked it. Ethereum generally didn't like it. Um, like for example, my you know one of my closest friends is an Ethereum bull. He liked it because he felt that he learned something from it, and basically he wants to be aware of some, kind of the alternative view. There are some other like Ethereum podcasters out there that appreciated it. They did like a crowdsource response. Uh, so you know it's one of those things. There's, there's a mixed uh, response, uh, and 
you know, I think one of the reasons press was trying to get Vitalik is because he was part of that crowdsource response. Like he read the article and uh, like was part of that crowdsource response where they, you know, kind of they, they try to answer some of the things. And so, you know, overall, it's just it's one of those things where, you know, I think if you look at the ESG concern, you know, people are worried about, say, state based attacks on on Bitcoin. And I think that in many ways, the ESG avenue is their state based attack. I think it's one of those things where if there were to be a concerted state-based attack on Bitcoin, um, you know, some of the some of the emerging markets can get away with saying like it threatens our currency, so we have to ban it, sort of thing, like you see some of these countries do. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you look at how the United States and Europe might respond, if they decide to respond aggressively, it's not gonna I, I don't think it's gonna be like, hey, we need to protect our currency by banning it. It's hey, look how much energy this usage. Uh, we need to do this for ESG concerns, right? So that might not there's a good chance that wouldn't be their primary motive. But that would be the one that they can use to get maybe a third or a half the population on board with 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 you know going after it. And so basically, I think that the the state based attack is basically trying to get the narrative on your side and throwing energy fight at Bitcoin. And so I do think it's important for people to constantly look into the data and understand kind of the mechanisms of how it works. So I see a lot of misconceptions out there, like people assume that the energy is on a per transaction basis. Whereas it's yeah. really not how how it works. Uh, two, they underestimate how much lightning can improve it. Uh, three, uh, they don't take into account the declining block subsidy, right? So even mm-hmm. though Bitcoin keeps using more energy, it keeps using a smaller percentage of energy as a percentage of its market cap, right? So you know, there's like an article I, I linked to a while ago. It was, it was written in like say 2017, 2018. It was like by 2020, Bitcoin will use all the world's energy. <laughs> and it's it uses a fraction of one percent of the energy in 2021, and it's like because people just don't, you know, and it, it's hard to because you know yeah if you're a journalist, but then you also have to spend hours and hours and hours understanding how the Bitcoin code works, and then have some you know degree of knowledge of the energy market, and it's it's one of those things that's, it's it's kind of a multidisciplinary subject, and you know you know basically even someone I I have a blend of engineering and finance background. And it still took me quite a bit of time to really dig into Bitcoin to fully understand it. It took kind of, you know, there's initial understanding. Then it was like a deeper layer uh, understanding. And then it was like, okay, now I have to get into lightning and understand that. It and never ends. Exactly. And especially if you're, if that's not, you know, if Bitcoin's not your day job, if, you know, you know, because I'm, you know, following multiple markets and I have to spin up on Bitcoin. And, and so if you're a journalist that covers multiple things, and then someone, your editor says, write about Bitcoin. You know, it's going to be really challenging to write a really informed piece. I mean, basically, the, the amount of hours I have to put into a Bitcoin piece have always been very large. Um, and so I can imagine that, you know, it's just it's really challenging for, you know, journalists writing about Bitcoin. And I do think it's important for members of the community to kind of, you know, push back and, and try to get the facts out wherever possible. And it's well, basically hope- this, this ongoing part of education. I hope uh, the additional time you've put in to Bitcoin has been worth it in terms of increased exposure and you've become one of our darlings and heroes of Bitcoin right now. And I think everyone appreciates your time and effort that you put into your work. Yeah, I've enjoyed learning. It's always it's always a, a challenge to add an extra asset class to your coverage list, uh, but it's certainly been one of the asset classes that I've been most excited about. Um, and so it, I basically really enjoyed kind of you know going into that rabbit hole and learning how it works and then you know kind of monitoring it and monitoring the health of the ecosystem and kind of hoping that it, it continues to succeed because I think it's really good technology and I think it's good for people to have. So the last thing I want to touch on with you is just general ma- macro outlook and, and Mr. Biden. Um, I was in a Starbucks the other day and I shared a picture that said certain goods, uh, certain food and drinks are not going to be available due to supply issues and we've uh we saw in the US there were supply issues with uh with oil, with oil um i think that was as i read that was down to uh, a shortage of drivers and an attack on a pipeline you know whatever the reason but lots of people are starting to share different data points for either increases in prices where inflation is hitting or supply chain issues how much of this are you tracking yourself and then also, in, in, in addition, I, I want to ask you about the six trillion Biden plan, but we'll come to that. Yeah, so inflation is one of the key things I'm tracking now because it, it's setting a, a lot of the, you know what what types of assets are going to do well, uh, and what what the Fed response is going to be, uh, and that of course impacts multiple multiple aspects of markets. 
And so what we're seeing now is a combination of low base effects from last year. So you know we were comparing current numbers, CPI numbers, to a dip last year. Uh, but then also on top of that base effect, uh, we have very hot month over month uh, numbers. So things are coming in above expectations. Uh, and that's there's a, there's kind of two main reasons for that. One is, uh, you know, the things I've been tracking for a while is the increase in broad money supply growth. And so ever since we saw the big money supply growth in in 2020, uh, which was different than anything that happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, so it's not just QE. It's it's QE that combined with fiscal spending that gets that money out into into people's bank accounts. Um, that is generally pretty correlated with price inflation. Uh, when you have the broad money supply go up, that's monetary inflation, and it tends to uh, uh, cause price inflation. But of course, the the degree to that depends on all sorts of things related to productivity and other deflationary forces. Uh, and so, you know, once we started to open up, my my base case was that that big increase in broad money supply is going to be price inflationary. Uh, now, the second thing you need is some sort of either productivity limit or scarcity. Uh, and so, for example, if you look back at the previous two inflationary decades, the 70s and the 40s, the 70s had the oil embargo, right? So you had oil shortages. And then the 40s had all sorts of commodity shortages related to, you know, you're trying to fight the war and you want every, you know, we even changed what we make our pennies out of because we needed to save the metal. Uh, and so, you know, both those decades, you know, basically you had, you had the combination of big money supply growth and some sort of scarcity somewhere. And so what we're seeing in 2020 and 2021 uh, is that we saw this big increase in broad money supply, uh, different countries did it at different paces. So the United States did it more than most other other countries, but most countries did did some kind of uh, big M2 broad money supply increase. And then you're getting uh, you know fragilities in the global supply chain. So semiconductors are 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 in short supply, uh, and so that's that's trickling into things like used cars, right? Because it's it's impacting how much new cars can be made, and therefore you know uh, people are going into the the used car market to pull you know increase the prices enough to convince people to sell. Uh, and so uh, then you're seeing food price inflation, you're seeing broad commodity uh, inflation. Uh, and so overall, we're, we're seeing pretty hot numbers come in. And I, I think that the, you know, we saw the, the April numbers reported in mid-May. And, you know, next month, we're going to get the May numbers reported in mid-June. I think those are going to be even higher year over year. Uh, but then after you, you go past that, uh, I think the rate of change could stabilize to some extent, where it's, it's no longer going up at the, at the rate it has been. Uh, but a key thing I keep pointing out is is the difference between transitory inflation in absolute terms and transitory inflation in rate of change terms. And so, for example, if you look at the 40s, you had these three big spikes of inflation. Uh, and so inflation would, would go from like zero to like 18 percent and then it would go back down to like one percent and then it would you know go to two percent and then it would go back up to like, you know, 12 percent and then it would go back down. But there was never really a period of deflation after the inflation. So it's not like prices went up and then came back down. Instead, they went up, they got to a new higher plateau, and then they stabilized, and then they went up again, then they stayed there and stabilized, and they went up again, and then they eventually stabilized for a longer period of time. And so what you have is kind of a permanent stepwise increase in prices. And so I think that's kind of, you know, the media is kind of mixing up what transitory means, that, you know, transitory means it's different than prices coming back down, it's prices going up and then just kind of... That's the new price. Yeah, that's the new price. And so, Mm. but of course, you'll have some things like, you know there there are key things that are really bottlenecked, like like lumber, for example, due to the sawmill constraint. So so timber is available; it's pretty cheap. Uh, but there's a, there's only so many sawmills, and so converting that timber into lumber has a bottleneck, and so you have this kind of parabolic price action. So I think some things like lumber are going to you know give back some of those gains. So they are, they already have to some extent, um, and so whether or not this was the peak, I don't really have a strong opinion. But basically. You know, I, there are certain kind of key things that got too expensive that will come back. But in a broad sense, uh, you know, a lot of these price increases, even when the dust settles, will be at a higher level uh, than than where they started. And then from there, it'll largely depend on what happens next with fiscal policy. Uh, you know, so if they don't do another big burst of fiscal, uh, you could get inflation leveling off again. Uh, whereas if they do another big burst of fiscal, that's when you're you're probably going to see another round of price increases. Okay, so the last thing is uh, Biden's six trillion dollar figure, which is a number I can't even get my head around. Um, what's your re- what was your reaction to that? Um, my my first reaction to all these things is is questioning what parts of it are going to get through Congress. And so, for example, the okay. president's the president's proposal usually does not get through Congress in the original form. Uh, and and as we've seen, for example, Biden's been working on this. Um, 
stimulus package separately, this uh, fiscal, the infrastructure bill, right? So, uh, you know, that, you know, kind of the first proposal was like three trillion and the Republicans were like, how about half trillion? And then they're like, okay, how about two and a half trillion? And they're like, okay, how about one trillion? Uh, and and defining what is what is infrastructure, right? So uh, kind of that, that, that debate's working its way through Congress. And it's one of those things where in the current environment, because the Senate is so closely divided, uh, you know, Biden can get something through with a budget reconciliation, meaning that only 50 votes are needed. But there are a handful of centrist Democrats that, you know, are, are kind of, you know, on the border between Democrat and Republican and that aren't on board with like, you know, the, the really big numbers. Um, and so, you know, in order to get through that, he needs to kind of tone it down. And and then, of course, the midterms come in. And so, you know, overall, what we're seeing is is kind of a dance between what the administration wants versus what they can get through the Senate. They can get most things through the House at this point, at least until the midterms, but getting things through the Senate is is kind of their current bottleneck. And so overall, what I'm weighing is is less so the headlines. I kind of fade the headlines a little bit, but they're they're directionally important to show where the administration's headed. Uh, and then we'll see what happens with the midterms, because if the you know the midterms, if you get a red sweep, uh, then it, it it probably reduces uh, what you're going to get. Whereas if if they strengthen the the blue Senate majority, then some of these bigger packages have a chance to go through. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm watching now is is more about kind of watching actual dealmanship in the Senate versus how that might affect the inflation versus deflation outlook compared to just these headline numbers. Crazy times, Lynn. Crazy times. Well, I think the most important thing we can take from this and we discussed here is that you're coming to Bitcoin 2021. Um, yeah, it's going to be fun. A, yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, it's going to be great to get everyone together. It's a wild bunch of people when we're all hanging out. Whether you can make it or, or not, I'm going to send you an invite to my party. Hopefully you can. You can come and hang out with some of us Bitcoiners. And, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, cool. Well, listen, I always love talking to you. Um, have an awesome month. Uh, I wonder what wild shit we'll be in for next time we speak. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Take care, Lynn. Yep, bye.